critically acclaimed NPR memoir, Never the Hope Itself, Love and Ghost in Latin America and Haiti. He was born in New York City and went to Colby College in Maine, where he studied the German language and literature. He went on to become a public radio reporter in Seattle, then covered Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean for National Public Radio. From there, he and his partner ended up in Barcelona, where they are raising their three kids. For 10 years, Haddon was the European correspondent for PRI's The World. He now makes documentary films and Everything Turns Invisible is his first novel. So welcome, welcome Jerry to Zoom in the Book. Thanks for having me, Kathy. So I'd love for you to tell the viewers your inspiration for these, this book and a little bit about yourself. Sure, well, as you said, I'm in Barcelona, Spain, where I've been living with my family for the last uh, 17 years, uh, we moved here from Mexico City. And uh, the inspiration for this book uh, actually came to me uh, over 30 years ago uh, when I was just a recent college graduate and uh, thought I was going to write the great American love story and um, began pecking away at my early version Macintosh computer living in New York City. and. Uh, just couldn't somehow get the story to come out. It was started to feel like uh, mm, sort of work a day and already told and and uh, overly self conscious. Probably all I had all these problems and writer's block with it. And uh, I I parked it and I left it alone for twenty five years. Probably uh, wrote another another novel that hasn't been published yet. Um, wrote the memoir. Did all my years of radio work. Um, and also during those years, I realized that uh, the book that I had started out to write, um, I, the motivation for it was all wrong. I thought I, I thought I wanted to write this love story uh, and I couldn't get the plot off the ground. And then I, I realized that it was actually a story about identity, about my, about my own identity, really. Um, I was adopted as a child and this, the, the, the protagonist in this, in this story is also an adoptee. And um, I, in my 20s, set out to search for my biological parents and was successful in that endeavor. And I often say, actually, that that was my training to become a journalist. Um, and after that process and uh, having a relationship with uh, some of my biological relatives and so forth, I came back to this story one day and realized that that was the, that was the sort of the kernel at the center of the story was really sort of that issue, not whether or not, you know, someone, you know, the, the love story. The love story was more on the surface. So I went back to it and, um, and um, you know, used that aspect of my life to tell the bigger story and then other aspects as well. There, you know, I went to college in Maine. There's a small college in Maine in this book. Um, but I just sort of blew everything up out of the water. You know, as I say, it's sort of, you know, possibly, you know, parts of my life, but on acid, really. You've had a fascinating life, Jerry. Um, I've uh, looked at your website for those who would like to get in touch with Jerry. Um, I will be posting links on the Facebook comments. Um, for those of you who are watching with us on Facebook, if you'd like to ask Jerry Haddon questions, please type them in the comments. We'll make sure he takes all your questions. Um, it's really interesting for Zoom into Books today to have an author talking to us from Barcelona, Spain. This is a first for Zoom into Books, so we're very excited about that. Um, Jerry, please tell us how much of this book is taken from your own life. Um, there are sort of structural elements, I would say, in the story that are from my life. The, the fact of having been adopted, um, I grew up uh, outside New York City. Uh, the story takes place in large part in the North Bronx. I, I did not grow up there, but it was an inspiration for me. It was a, a, a place that I could see from 
from where I lived, but didn't know well. Um, um, there are other things in there, like the fact that I went to uh, college in Maine, to, Col to Colby College. There's a fictitious college in the story. Um, and sort of the travel trajectory in some ways of my life, going to Germany to study, um, even ending up in Spain. Those are all elements that figure in the book. Um, but I would say principally, you know, where, where I where I borrow from my own life is, is through the experience of being an adoptee and, and, and that, that, that sense of not quite understanding who I am and where I come from, uh, even though, uh, you know, by and large, I, I had a, you know, very a happy childhood and so on. Um, we have had um, another author on who did a search for birth parents. Is this something that you have thought about doing? I, I did it actually. When I was in, in my mid twenties and living in New York City, um, I, I decided that um, I, I wanted to know more about my, my biological beginnings and my adoptive parents who <clears throat> never kept anything a secret uh, from, from me or from my sister who was also adopted, shared all the paperwork they had. But um, at the time records were sealed. I think they still may be in New York State. Uh, so it took me, uh, you know, pre-internet investigating more than a year to find my biological mother. And, um, and then it uh, took another couple of years after getting to know her uh, to find my biological father who wasn't even living in the U.S. So it was a long, a long, argu arduous, fun in a way, interesting and ultimately fulfilling journey for me to take because it did help me understand who I was and, and why I am the way I am. I know that your book deals with race, um, at least indirectly. Um, that is a hot topic around the globe right now in uh, society. So how did you approach that aspect of the story? Uh, without thinking about it too much. I mean, there are um, you know, there are black characters, there are Afro-Cuban characters, there are white characters. Um, they're all sort of mixed up together. Um, and I didn't, uh, I didn't approach it with kid gloves or overly think it. I just, um, you know, I just, however, I don't know how the imagination ultimately works, but I just made people up. Uh, I have a bit of a background in Afro-Cuban music. I studied it for a while and used to, used to play in some, in some bands when I lived in Seattle. Um, so um, the whole sort of Afro-Cuban and Orisha aspect of the story, you know, I had firsthand knowledge and experience in, in that aspect of it. Uh, but the rest of it was just letting the characters, you know, go on the page and to see where they would, would take the story. Um. That's great. We have a question. Um, the question is, once you revisited the project after all those years, how much of an effort did it take for you to finally finish it? Um, a big one, but, a, but a, an effort that, that, was, uh, that flowed. I mean, it was just the story just came out, um, especially when I decided um, to have the, the main characters all be juvenile delinquents that were being released from, uh, from incarceration on the second chance program. That's not part of my personal experience, uh, nearly, but uh, no, I never ended up in jail as a kid or anything like that. Um, uh, and when I, once I had that idea, somehow that sort of freed me up to invent even more things and the story just sort of took on wings uh, of its own and it probably took um, a couple of years. Um, and then the sort of editing process was a bit longer than that, but luckily it came out in German first. So the book actually went through a really heavy, heavy, heavy uh, edit in English before the translation was done. Um, so I had that advantage, which is one of the reasons why uh, I decided to self-publish because I had that, you know, that holds a lot of people back from self-publishing. Um, because you think, well, is this, is this any good? Has someone else read it? Has a professional read it? I'd, it had already been through the ringer on, on my end. So that gave me more confidence. That's a good way to approach it. Uh, Self-publishing for the author is always reinventing the publishing wheel. And um, it takes a lot of perseverance. 
And it's very interesting to hear from your side that it's already in what two languages? It's yeah, it came out actually weirdly was published first in German by a strange stroke of fate uh, that came out, I think in 2018 now. And um, they, I, I sold them the, the world language rights, but they did not uh, bring it out in English. So those rights, rights reverted back to me. Uh, and that's why I'm self-publishing. Well, that's great. Um, let's set the stage here for the viewers. Would you like to read an excerpt for us, please? Sure, sure, be happy to. Um, I'll, the first one I'll read uh, is just from the beginning because I think that makes the most sense. Uh, start at the top. Okay, uh, this is it. Everything Turned Invisible, part one. Wimple, Maine, September, 1985. One morning, you're just stewing in juvie, cracking wise to the universe, until, as a matter of course, some amoeba-brained bunkmates come round and hammer you to the floor for the 734th time. The next, you're on a bus rolling toward some college near the North Pole, with the guy next to you playing spelling bee against himself. You never could have made sense of it, much less recognized it for the second chance that it supposedly was. Yet there you were, rolling with the punches instead of taking them. M A double S A C H U S C double T S, the guy says. Sean Patrick Sullivan, Bonstable, Massachusetts. Why'd you spell it? Can you spell it? You could just abbreviate like the postal system. So, a smart guy. I had an aisle seat. There was not one thing to look at but woods. Slide your window open, I said. It's hot as hell. Enjoy it while you can, Massachusetts said. The guy was my age, I guess, but that's about where the similarities ended. He was huge and red-haired and taking up half the bench. His pale green button-down dress shirt stretched skin tight against his upper arms, like he was four-fifths of the way to the Hulk. Soon it's going to start snowing, he said, and it's not going to stop snowing till next summer. Summer, I said. S-U-M-M-E-R. Summer. Next stop, Wimple College, came Powder's voice over the bus intercom. Dr. Horace Power powders, the guy running this pilot project, achieving in Maine, or just AIM. None of us knew yet what it was really about, only that it had just snatched each of, each of us off our own custom-made runaway chariots of trouble. That is, it had gotten us out of lockup exactly one day earlier. I was twitching like some lucky lab rabbit with its cage door left open. I didn't see your parents at drop-off, Massachusetts said. Yeah, you didn't. So what, you like an orphan? Sullivan Prieto Bowles, Powder said. Grab your parachutes, boys. We are over the target. Said target we'd learned just about, we'd learned about just that morning at AIM's first and only orientation, a meet and greet for the 13 troublemakers who organizers had drudged up and dragged to this press event in a motel off I-95 outside Augusta, Maine. Smile for the cameras, kids. Apparently, our respective penal institutions had nominated us for this experimental scholarship because at some point in our lives, we'd shown a glimmer, however faint, of academic promise. And I can only guess that academic promise implied general promise, as in, we might figure out how to live right generally, like getting a job, paying money for stuff, learning to prepare food, to clean up after ourselves, maybe washing your own actual car on a Sunday morning instead of wrecking someone else's the night before. All the mundane, mysterious stuff you could see other people doing so naturally, month after month, year after year, until the day they died and someone would notice. I could keep going. <laughs> no, that, that gets us there. Thank you. Um, we've had another question pop in. You touched on this. Um, <laughs> you, had, you had mentioned jail. The question yes. is, have you ever been in a French jail? Yes, well, uh, the poser of the question and I uh, did come close at one point, way back when, when we were traveling around Europe as young backpackers in college, and uh, we committed the heinous crime of falling asleep in a first-class train car when we only had second-class tickets in the hallway. And uh, we were indeed dragged to the police station in Strasbourg, France, where we proceeded to charm our way out of it, I think, and pay an 80 franc fine. But no, so I didn't actually see the inside. <laughs> well, that's good. 
That's good. Um, with all of your of your travels, I know that um, one of the uh, locations in your book is West Germany. Um, would you like to talk about your experience in West Germany and how it relates to the book? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I went to, the first time I went to Germany to study was in the spring, the winter of 1986. Uh, of course, so the Cold War was, uh, uh, still had three years, three and a half years to go. Uh, and, and Germany was divided down the middle. And we all ended up in a little village called Trabemünde, which is north of Lübeck. And um, uh, I, I lived with a family about um, half a mile from the, from the border. And for this, you know, 18 year old, it was uh, just, I mean, a surreal experience, absolutely mind blowing to, to walk down to the edge of the beach and, and, and see uh, just across this tiny river in these barbed, line, this barbed wire fencing and, and these East German uh, uh, Navy boats patrolling the coastline. And we were told by our host family that, um, uh, uh, you know, you, you had to be careful. You couldn't cross this line of buoys because there were booby traps in the water and you'd be arrested and then you'd spend, you know, days and days in an East German jail, you know, explaining what you'd been doing over there. So it was all just an extremely eye-opening experience for, a, for a, you know, a teenager to see something like that up close. And um, uh, there is a, a, a moment and a place in the novel uh, based loosely on that village um, where um, the protagonist goes uh, as much to escape from um, uh, his own personal problems um, uh, as to escape from somebody who, who's out to kill him. Um, but he ends up in a place like that and, and has a sort of a similar experience of just sort of not believing where he is at first. Does that take us, does that relate to the title? Everything Turns Invisible? How'd you come up with the title? The, the title is actually um, more related to something that happens in the story that I can't uh, talk about because it would be too much of a spoiler, um, but also the sense uh, that the protagonist has of, of not fully existing like everybody else, um, especially due to um, a tragedy that occurs within this adoptive family where he's growing up, um, for which he shoulders a lot of the blame. So, um, so it's his sense as he's getting older that he's actually, instead of growing up and becoming, He's sort of unbecoming, he's turning invisible. Um, this, is, this is another great question. And I was just looking at that too. Um, you've had quite a career in public radio. Um, the question that's come in is, did your years in public radio and writing uh, for, for them influence how you told this story? I think definitely, yeah. Uh, I mean, because uh, a career in public radio is a career in writing anyway. So you're spending your entire time reporting, but also just becoming a better writer in general. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the book is filled with, you know, not just visual descriptions, but audio, uh, uh, audio descriptions of, of the things that are happening. So I was uh, well aware, you know, that that's a tool that you can use to bring a place or a person or a scene to life, not just what you're seeing, but what it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. And now you make documentary films. Is that something you're doing currently? Yes, it is. Uh, I've got about four films going at once right now. Um, uh, here in Europe on something on climate change. We're working on something on public schools in New York City. Uh, so yeah, we've got a bunch of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. And I'm still dabbling in public radio as well. Oh, I lost you. I can't hear you. Hold on. Sorry, I Sorry. was muted there. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting how you're working um, in Spain, working for New York City. It just shows how technology has decreased 
space. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right, yeah. location for us. Um, would you please read another excerpt from your book? Sure, happy to, let's see. Okay, so uh, the second section, what should I read here? Da -da -da. Okay, so this um, is actually a quieter moment in the book, um, but it's an important uh, turning point for the protagonist uh, in terms of his sense of security and identity in his early childhood. Uh, and I, won't, I think that's enough to start reading. Um, uh, I should say that the, his adoptive parents' names are Hippolito and Miriam, and they are Afro-Cuban. And they came to the United States um, seeking asylum and were granted it. And they're musicians, and they're successful musicians. They make a living at it. And, and this is the, the world and the family in which he's growing up. Hippolito and Miriam never hid the fact of my adoption from me. Not that they could have anyway, given that I was the lone pistachio in a bowl of cashews but they weren't exactly talking about stuff either. Until one day, the great I wish it had never happened but can't erase it now day. I was in the laundry room, five years old, playing my bongos in my usual winter spot, back up against the boiler, keeping warm. In front of me, the deep slosh of the long bank of washing machines. Miriam was emptying a load of laundry into a plastic hamper and she was singing, making up lyrics to the rhythm. A Milo le gustan las alcachofas. Milo likes artichokes. No, but he doesn't like ice cream. Mama, I said, looking up at her and her afro. It was positively colossal and made me think of my own weird, where, uh, where are you from anyway hair. Was my dad blonde like me, I asked. I don't know about your father, she said. She leaned against one of the washing machines, her arms folded across her chest. She hesitated. The air in the room changed. But your mother was blonde. She was? And who was she? She was a woman with a hard life. What was she called? I don't know. Sometimes they tease me. Who? In the park, I said. What do they say? Patico Blanco. Don't pay them any attention, my little ducky. Patico Blanco means white duck in English, in Spanish. Miriam kneeled in front of me and put one hand on the bongo, the other on my shoulder. With gestures like that, it was like she was completing a circuit. Sometimes people get into trouble, she said. That's what happened to your biological mother. She was very poor. Why? I don't know, but she helped me and Hippolito. She probably saved us from having to live in a jail. Did you know that? Your mama was a hero. I tried not to smile. A hero. And was she also Cuban? She was from here a hero from here. How did she help you not to live in the jail? She invited us to Italy, then Spain, then to play here at Carnegie Hall. Imagine that. What's that? Where's Italy? Carnegie Hall is close by. Italy, I'll show you on a map. Will you show me today? I will. And, and my mind was racing. Now that I'd asked the first question, the first ever about this, and gotten an answer of sorts, I had a hundred more all piling into each other. I didn't want this talk to end. It was a dreadful and exhilarating new feeling. And then what, Mama, I said, what did my she do next? She helped us escape from the people who were trying to control us. And, and my Mama was a hero, Mama. She got us to Spain, then you were born and we adopted you. The last thing your Mama did was invite us to New York. It was our last chance. And do you have other kids? I was running out of new things to say. Miriam touched my face. You've seen the pictures. Can they come live with us? She picked up the basket of clothes. You're a hero too. No, you're a hero. Why, Mama? Why am I? She kissed my head. Because you helped us to be a family again. In the apartment, Miriam pulled out an oversized book filled with nothing but maps and showed me Italy. Then Milan, the city she'd fallen in love with, the first they'd reached after leaving Cuba on what was supposed to be a short state-sponsored tour and after which they'd named me, Milan, Milano, meant a new beginning for them, a fresh start, an escape, and I was its enduring symbol. 
But sitting next to Miriam, looking at that map, something else inside me stirred. Where everything about my past had been an abstraction, now there was this, the trailhead of a route for my imagination to follow. Even if the route had long grown cold, had long grown cold, I could suddenly and for the first time imagine myself traveling the converging accidental lines of destiny that had led to this very moment and backwards too, to my conception. New York, Matanzas, Madrid, Milan, each leg a step closer to the entry portal that no one remembers, but which gives everyone such surety, a step closer to the woman who'd given birth to me, actually seeing her in my head. What an image, what a terrible thing. There was a duplicate of myself, physically the same and happy, happier maybe, kicking cans around a different housing complex in a different life with my real parents in their hard, heroic lives. Forgive me, Miriam, my mom who counted, but how it hurt. It hurt like homesickness, but how could I pine for a place that had never existed, for a person I'd never known? I tried to push the longing away, but I couldn't. I suddenly didn't want to talk about such possibilities. Here was my mother. I leaned against Miriam's thin arm, then wrapped it around me to shield myself from the feeling. When that didn't work, I tried a new trick that's pretty much kept me on the fucked side of screwed ever since. I flipped my sense of betrayal and the shame over it into anger a silent, unjustified anger that flamed against my ribs, burning for any target to make up for my sorry-ass weakness. I aimed at first at the shadow figure of this unknown woman who'd suddenly sprung to life, into my inner life, making me feel for the first time that what I had somehow wasn't enough. And then at the woman hugging me now, for this lapse in our family defenses. Why did you answer my question, Mama? In doing so, you exposed my turncoat heart. I tried to push the anger and confusion away. I did try. Thank you. That was, it's riveting. Your writing is very good. Um, you. And it, your character development, just the few passages we've heard, we're starting to get to know your characters. Um, for those of you who have joined us late, we're talking with, a journalist and author Jerry Haddon from Barcelona, Spain. He's talking about his first novel, Everything Turns Invisible. Um, Jerry, you've got the town of Verdiville in your book. We were discussing that earlier. Yeah. Um, would you like to give us the background of that? Sure, yeah. Uh so uh, I grew up uh, just north of New York City in Westchester County. Um, uh, it's a small town that bordered the North Bronx. And there, in the 19, I think in the late 60s, early 70s, a, an experimental housing uh, complex opened up called Co-op City, which is a lot of people know that if you're from the East Coast. Um, and uh, co you know, Co-op City uh, went south pretty quickly at the, in the beginning, at least, I think later on, um, they, I think they sort of figured it out and it became, you know, I, I know people who know people who live there and they said it was, you know, by and large, and sort of a normal place to live. But in the beginning, uh, the story, at least, you know, from where I was living was that, um, you know, they, it was this experiment in, in vertical housing and uh, they, they built this place out on this, on this landfill um, that had been, you know, compacted down and, and but there was no, there was no um, way to communicate with the rest of the city. There were no subway lines. There was a, a, a single or overpass and a tunnel to get out there. So they ended up putting all of these, you know, uh, middle class and lower middle class families, um, you know, stacked up in these huge towers. Um, without the services, they needed a sense of connection to the rest of the city. And uh, I think the area fell initially, as I said, in, into, into, a, into blight. Uh, and to crime and so on and so forth. Um, um, I'm not an expert at all on Co-op City. I just, I just uh, it, as a kid, it always intrigued me. Uh, and so I used it as, the, uh, as a very loose model for Verdiville, which um, suffers many of the same problems, but has also some, some uh, very distinct uh, qualities to it as well that I, uh, I won't go into without giving too much away. That's interesting. I remember those developments too. Um, what's your target market for this book? Who do you see as your customer? 
Um, well, um, you know, that is um, kind of a tough question to answer. I mean, I, I think that uh, anyone who's had an experience in adoption might enjoy reading the book because it, that is such a central theme, whether you're an adoptee or an adoptive uh, parent or a biological parent who somehow participated and uh, may have given up a, a, a baby or a child for adoption, uh, because that's a, that's a theme that runs throughout the book. Um, I, but it's also, you know, the bigger story is just, it's more universal than that. It's a young person trying to find their place in the world. And, you know, that's, that's what every young person goes through at some point, uh, uh, more, least, more easily or more, with more difficulty than others. It depends. But so um, I would say, you know, late teens, all the way up, really, um, to anyone who um, enjoys a good yarn. You know, I think it's a... The, 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 the Germans classified this as new adult fiction when they brought it out. Um, and for people who don't know that term, it doesn't mean that it's um, new adult fiction, but it's new adult fiction, which means it's someone who's not a teenager anymore, but they're not really a grown up either. So it's this kind of subcategory, coming of age genre. I mean, this is the marketing people who, who need to do this so that books, bookstore owners know where to put books on their shelves. But I would like to think anyway, to get back to your question, that it's a universal story that anyone would enjoy. I would say um, young adult and up for mm -hmm. here in the States, that looks like a, a good market for it. And adoptive families, everybody's got a story to tell and it helps to read books like yours within the adoptive family because it creates conversation. And uh, that's always a good thing. Um, tell us who you read. Who are your favorite authors? Uh, I've got so many. Uh, I'm a big Wallace Stegner fan. Uh, his short stories. Uh, Cormac McCarthy is probably my uh, literary hero and uh, um, someone whose works I've devoured, you know, more than once. Um, uh, what am I reading right now? What's on my bookshelf right now? Um, I, I'm reading, uh, oh, The Cockroach right now, which is a great book. Um, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I mean, I read constantly and uh, yeah, I don't have a, nothing else, else comes to mind at the moment. Uh, people always like to know who their favorite authors read. It's, it's always a, a common question. Um, I'm fascinated by uh, one piece of your bio that I read on your website, um, that the work you were doing with public radio in Seattle, is that where you started, I do believe? I did, yeah. Yep. Um, KPLU. Tell me about... Okay, there's a sentence here. It took you from an undercover undercover mission inside the UN the day after the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center garage to the white villages of Grenada, Spain. Um, how about elaborating on that? I found that fascinating. Yeah, that well, that was actually, uh, that was describing the search for my biological parents actually. And which is why I said earlier that my a great deal of my training to become a journalist, I think happened just, you know, doing that sort of sleuthing early on. Uh, what, what had happened with uh, in New York City uh, back in 1993 was that I had um, I had narrowed down the search for my biological mother to the to the Fulbright scholarship program. Uh, and those records are housed in the UN. Um, and at the time, the advice that I had been given by people who were uh, experienced searchers in, in states that frowned on people searching, uh, the advice, the main piece of advice that I had been given was not to tell somebody what I was really after, because it was a hot button issue. And if you didn't, if, if, if it was the, someone who was gonna push the wrong button, then a door was gonna shut forever and you were gonna lose access potentially to information. So, um, uh, I actually, with a very good friend of mine, uh, wrote a letter to the UN 
uh, claiming to be a female scholar researching uh, women ac uh, academicians from the 1960s who had gone on and comparing them. I made up this thesis basically that was you know completely fabricated, and then and then talked to a girlfriend of mine in to being the, the author of that letter because I wrote as a woman. And uh, we eventually, to our surprise, got a letter back from Fulbright saying, you're welcome to come in and, and go through the records. And then that first uh, World Trade Center bombing happened in the garage, right, in 93. And uh, we had the meeting the next morning at, at the UN. And my friend called me and said, you know, should we cancel? And I said, you know, you're kidding, you've been waiting like six months to get in there. There was no way we're going to cancel. So um, we put on our fake wedding rings and sort of memorized, you know, the, you know, our, our fake names. And uh, that was it. We didn't, we didn't have any ID or anything. And we waltzed over to the UN and we walked in and there were, you know, police everywhere with military dogs. The subway had been shut down. The whole city was sort of, had come to a standstill. And we walked up to the uh, the concierge desk, and you know, and I and my friend said, "Oh, you know, I'm so and so here to go up to the uh, Fulbright offices." And uh, they just called up, and the person came down, and no one asked us for ID, and we just went up. and And within 15 minutes of having the records, I'd found my biological mother. So it's extremely, extremely lucky. And uh, the Spain, the Spain thing, that's my biological father uh, is, is uh, lives in Spain, actually. So uh, that was a, a whole another search that happened years later. That's amazing what research can do for an author. You never know where it's going to take you. And uh, when I saw that, that line, I thought, oh, we have to hear that story. That's incredible um, that you got through with no ID. Yeah, there's a huge orange sign behind the desk that said, all visitors must show photo ID. Uh, but I think, you know, we were the, our, our, our reason for being there was so innocuous that uh, it didn't raise any red flags. And so there we were on the elevator. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, that was very lucky for you yeah. um, to get that information. I know that researching family a regular genealogy can be very difficult, but with an adoptee, it's it's even more so. Right, um, it's got much easier with the internet and and, and the DNA testing and all the genetics work. True. Um, we've had a question. Um, the viewers have really enjoyed your readings. We'll ask you to, to do another one here in a minute. Um, they want to know if you will be bringing out an audio book. Uh, I am actually. I'm going to. I'm. I'm going to do the audio book, and I'm going to do it myself. Um, and hopefully, my radio experience will make it uh, bearable for listeners. And also, some of some of my old friends from the public radio world are giving me tips on 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 best ways to do it and so forth. What I need to figure out is if it's something I'll just try to do, you know, and work with Audible or make it something that I release in serial form on my website. I have to sort of think it through, but I definitely, definitely want to do that. And I think it'll be a lot of fun. That's terrific. Are you working on something new at the moment? Um, I have another novel written, um, but, you know, as writers know, that doesn't mean anything because the process of, of uh, bringing out the, the story is just editing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and writing. So, but I, I've got it sort of done from A to Z, I think. Um, and I will start working on this uh, probably this summer at some point, yeah. That's great. I know you have a lot of fans and they're waiting for the next one. That's terrific. Um, how about reading us one last passage, please? Okay, so uh, as we talked about earlier, the, the protagonist in the story ends up uh, in a little village on the East German border, but this is what happens um, on his, nearly his last day in the States as he um, is um, hoping to say goodbye uh, to a young woman who he considers the love of his life, and also dodge um, a character who's out to uh, whack him before he can leave the States. 
uh, and even figure out where to stay before his flight to Germany because he's become estranged from his adoptive family, so he has nowhere to go. So this is the uh, short chapter. Standing on the ice only added to my sense of insecurity, but I was the one who'd asked her to meet me out here on the center of Togen Pond, where no one could overhear us, where I could see the long road climbing from Wimple to campus. I had one eye out for a squad car, the other for anyone black and packing. I spent the last two and a half weeks on Massachusetts floor, and now there were just a couple of hours left for me on the Wimple campus, the final stretch. Seeing Halsey again was ripping my heart down the center, but I couldn't not see her. What are we doing out here? I wanted to explain, I said lamely. These things just have their momentum. And ours? I never knew I was going to meet you, much less that you'd give someone like me the time of day. Across the pond, the firs at the forest's edge stood like great racks of dresses, their sleeves gathering snow. Well, I did, didn't I? But why? You're a year older, your friends are older, you act older. Sometimes on the weekends, you go off who knows where, some mountain resort owned by the Kennedys or something. The Kennedys, she said. Who do you think I am? And why this need to control me? My grandfather, he was a Turkish guest worker in Germany, I'll have you know. My mother came to the U.S. when she was 16 with nothing. My dad's a school teacher. I think you're a bit confused. Where in Germany? Doesn't matter. Hanover. The point is, I'm as far from high society as you. Huh, well, you fake it well. I'm not faking anything. I just, I just don't give a shit. I do. I don't belong here, I said. Not even close. Clearly, you've convinced yourself of that, but that's where you're screwed up, Milo. You do belong here. You're different. This place needs you. I need you. I don't want you to go. She raised her fist in the air. She was clutching a chunk of metal. But here you are, going. Wait, I said. Oh, shit, I thought. She's going to crack my nose. Close your eyes. Don't. I felt her slip the metal thing into my coat pocket. What is that? The beginning of me, she said. Now you have to come back. She punched my chest and started walking, fast. I kept my eyes closed. Do not open them. If you do, you won't leave. And if you don't leave, you'll be jailed again or killed. Or if by some miracle, neither, neither of those, then just plain lost. You will watch yourself wreck everything because you're in love, but loving lies beyond your range of possibilities. The footfalls crunching through the snow. Softer, softer, silence. I let a long moment pass and I knew she was gone. I opened my eyes, scanned the road again. I put my hand in my pocket and pulled the object out. It was a ring, or more precisely, the circular metal fitting of a sink drain. So she hadn't made her story up. There was her name, inscribed in it, inscribed on it like runes. Earlier in the story, she tells the story of where her own name comes from, and it's, that's a reference to that. Well, I think you have everyone interested. And um, Jerry's book is available on Amazon, and there's also a link on his website. Um, and all those links are posted in the Facebook comments. Um, I think your book, it has a very wide market. The, mo the more I hear you read, um, I, I think you have um, a very important book in this genre for families and young people because young people are looking for these kind of books at this particular time. Um, as we are getting ready to wind up the interview here. What is the message that you would like for people to take away from your book? Uh, I've never thought about that. What would the message be? I mean, uh, you know, this is a story about, uh, about someone who gets a second chance, but it's a second chance that uh, it's not the obvious one. Um, it's not the second chance that's presented in the beginning of the book. Possibly it it comes sort of maybe out of left field, um, so I guess you know maybe the message would be that uh, you know don't give up, don't give up, keep trying to get wherever you're trying to get to, and and eventually some door, some window will open, and things will work out. That's a great message. 
Um, I'm assuming that you do visits, book clubs, schools, um, homeschool groups. You can do them virtually uh, for sure. Is this something that you have done in the past? Are you willing to do that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the timing of the book coming out now, the school ends, at least uh, in this part of the world, you know, high school is ending this week and next week. Um, but I am trying to um, set up readings now in the American school and the English language schools here in, in Barcelona, where I live, um, looking into doing a possible visiting uh, writers program back in the States, perhaps next January. So yeah, I'm, of course, uh, always open to sharing. That's great. Do you know when you'll be back in the States again? Uh, not sure. Hopefully this summer to see my family. Okay. Well, hopefully when you come, you'll get to do some book signings and um, you can check uh, Jerry Hedden's website for his current events. Um, what is the next thing you have planned for your book? Or do you have anything coming up? Um, no, not especially, just to start working on the schools for the fall, essentially, and keep submitting it and hopefully get it reviewed. You know, that's tough for indie publishers um, to catch the eye of traditional reviewing places. But, um, but you know, I've gone down this road with two traditional publishers before and um, had to do the same amount of self-marketing work with them. So it's actually not any different. Tell us briefly about your previous books. Uh, well, uh, back in 97, I co-wrote a book with uh, a fellow named Pete Nelson, who has since gone on to be a pretty famous guy in the treehouse world. He had a TV show called Treehouse Masters, on, I think on Discovery for about 10 years. Uh, it was a, a sort of a fun, funny how to build your own treehouse. It was a great project. It was early in both of our careers. We had a blast doing it. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, that's when I got into journalism and eventually ended up working for NPR and, and heading to Latin America. And um, that, the second book is a memoir uh, that was published by Harper Perennial back in 2000, I think 2011 now. And yeah, it was the, um, it was the sort of, uh, you know, my version of events that happened during that time. Uh, it was right after 9-11 when Latin America sort of fell off the map. Um, yet there were a bunch of reporters down there trying to tell the world about what was happening in, in the Caribbean and Cuba and Haiti and Mexico, Central America, farther south. Um, and the personal experiences uh, and impressions I had uh, of that time and also meeting, you know, the love of my life, uh, who's, you know, who with whom I started my family. So. That's terrific. And all of these books are available on your website? Yes. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, Jerry, I want to thank you so much for coming to Zoom Into Books. It's been a pleasure meeting you. I know our viewers have really enjoyed it. Um, for those of you who might have missed the first part of the interview, it will be available on Facebook at Zoom Into Books and the Headline Books Facebook pages. And in a few weeks, it'll be live on the uh, Zoom Into Books YouTube channel. And when that comes out, we'll post the link for that too. If you have questions for the author, you can continue to put them in the Facebook comments. He will check back there um, for a few weeks. And if you'd like to get in touch with him, please go to his website, jerryhadden.com. So thank you very much, Jerry, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you very much, Kathy. Take care. Thank you.